So here we are in the SD7T uh, Quantum Offline. Um, if you're doing this at home and you want to have a go, you could do it in the, the 7T uh, software or the SD9 or the SD10T software, all available from the website. Uh, once you've downloaded and installed it, in the system menu, uh, come to the enable extensions and here you can switch on um, the theater option. On a console, you don't have to buy a code to switch this on. Um, but in the offline software, you can switch it on for free. So come in here and switch on your theater software. Uh, and you'll have to restart your offline software and it comes up in a, in a, in a different mode. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to run through the steps needed to build uh, the start of a theatre show. There are a number of steps that you have to take really before you start building queues. Um, and really this is, is, is important because it's about the underlying structure and data that we're then managing. You know, one of the things that's quite different in theatre or an installation like this compared with normal live touring is the the length of it you know a theater show could go in and run for 10 years um, at which point there's gonna be lots of changes of operators and rebuilds and you know changes to the cast so how we manage the data is really really important so the first thing I'm going to do is uh, open up my audio IO I mean here I would build my my session put my racks in of course you can add racks in offline um, and you can you know, add what you need to do uh, to, to build these. Again, we're going to do everything we can in terms of naming um, to put this together so that everything is done before we make our first queue. So that's Audio.io, that needs setting up. Again, you could do the same thing with your Madiports here if you're doing um, QLab playback systems and sound effects and recorder systems. You know, I'll keep saying it, everything that you can do to make the audio part, the console part audio before you make any cues, you should. So to get this process going, I'm going to label some channels up. So we've got some, some channels to play with. So if I flip over here to the channel screens, I'm just going to put some names in here. Um, and then put some girls' names. B, and we have boy one type or two girl one girl two. So we've got some channel to play with. So let's also see down the bottom here the LCD buttons are unlit at the moment. That's because they're not patched. So if I patch the channels, uh, let's just use the local I.O you'll see those first eight, which have now have patches, um, have got some color to them. They're blue because they're closed. Once the channel's are open, so it's unmuted, and the fader is up, again, it will change color. This gives us a really easy visual feedback looking across the surface to see what channels are gonna pass audio, what's rooted, what isn't rooted. Uh, you can also see that the channels are muted in theater by default. Um, all channels, all input channels start muted. Um, and there is no master bus. Um, this is again a function of our theater software. Um, we don't really mix to a master and distribute it like we might do in you know, normal live uh, rock and roll touring. Um, we're gonna use the matrix in order to build lots of subgroups and bring them into a matrix and derive all of our speaker feeds uh, for the house and delays in the balcony and you know proceeding and all these things via the matrix. So um, it's quite a different sort of audio workflow. From a processing point of view, what we have here in theatre actually is very uh, almost identical really to what we have in live. So on a quantum console, we have our mustard and our SD processing. Um, you know, the audio processing is the same. The only difference, if I come back to the master screen here, is um, in the matrix, we have an extra function here, which is our delays. And we'll talk about those in a minute. Um, but that is individual delays on individual nodes, allowing us to, you know, from a creative point of view, from a sound design point of view, um, control the audio a little bit, a little bit better. So we're not gonna come and build our, our queue list yet. Um, there's some other things to have a look at. Let's open up our options panel. Uh, and there is, as you see up here on the right hand side, a theatre tab. Um, 
the first option here is our optional button control. So in normal um, SD Live software, the optional button on the surface controls channels and gain. So if you're in a, uh, a bank of channels, holding optional will affect the entire bank, which is great for speed of operation, putting on high bus filters and you know performing functions like that across the whole bank. If you have gang channels, the optional defeats the gang. So again, putting in offsets and making changes to individual members within a gang. But in theatre, actually, we primarily use the optional button for controlling elements of our auto update. Um, so it's very useful, actually, and what I would do was put this switch onto a macro to allow us to very quickly switch between here without opening the panel. Um, the idea being in theatre, in, in our auto update system, is that changes you make to channel parameters automatically update through the queue list. You don't have to press update um, on the work surface, it happens all automatically, all the data is automatically written, um, and it happens across the queue list. And the reason being is that if you take a character in the show, you know, Billy Elliot or you know, Mary Poppins or whoever it is, um, you know, when they appear on stage as themselves, their settings are going to always pretty much be the same. You know, we have mechanisms to deal with costume changes and how that might affect settings. But, you know, for, for, for the most part, for most characters, when they appear on stage, they appear as themselves and their settings are the same. And if you make a change to an EQ for Mary Poppins, when she appears later on, you want that EQ to be the same and to be repeated as well. So. Um, this sort of sort of analog style workflow is really what we're promoting. Of course, it then has a bunch of tools which make it more powerful and allow us a huge amount of control about the channel settings. But the sort of the strong message here is that changes are written automatically. It would make no sense if those changes were written for every function. So, for example, here with our mutes. If we mute a channel, we don't want that mute to be written for the entire show. We want it to be written for just the queue we're in. So that's why we have it selected here. Same with delays, generally. If you're changing a delay, it's because of an artistic reason. Um, there's some action on stage that needs a different delay setting because of you know positioning. Um, and so when you make a change to the delay, you want it just to be for the queue you're in and not all queues. All these other ones which are on the set, if you change EQ, it writes to the entire show. If you change dynamics or orc sends or insert routes, whatever, it changes for the entire show. You can change these at any given time and depending on your way of working and your workflow and what you're trying to achieve, you might well want to change the scopes and change the way this works. Um, and so have a play with it and, and see what works for you. But for the most part, probably mutes and delays are likely to be the two items set. When we get into characters and, and a bit more of the data stuff later on, um, we're going to show you how we deal with alternate actors, you know, traditionally understudies, people who would take on a role, you know, if, if someone was sick. Um, there are differences between people who play roles um, and we need a way of controlling it. And so we have a scope for that, which we will, we will have a look at. Uh, relative failures in queue groups. If you have a big musical number that needs lots of cues to uh, have, you know, chorus, verse, chorus, verse type mixing um, programming capabilities, um, you could group those cues together, and this function allows you to make relative changes at the beginning of a group. Maybe you know someone's you know, a bit loud, and you want to pull them down a bit. Those changes can be relatively, so by a, a, a dB change, for example. Um, written across the group of cues so that as you fire through the little group of cues for a musical number those little relative changes that you make are maintained and carried through the group so we have a it's quite a, a specialist function but we can have a go at demonstrating that on another video if people would like feel free to comment and let us know the hide control group join leave buttons this relates to the LCD buttons across the surface um, we have a very specific workflow for programming control groups in theatre. So um, one thing I would encourage you to do if you're on a real uh, theatre desk of ours is to switch this on and restart the console and it hides that join leave LCD function. 
um, because really you want to stick to one method of programming and our control group cues panel which we're going to demonstrate in, a, in another video um, is the way to do it and there's very good reasons for that um, from a workflow point of view um, and a speed point of view and accuracy and all those things mean that this isn't really the way to do it so turning this function off is the best thing to do uh, you saw when I was on my channels earlier that the LCD buttons were blue, our fader off colour if you like. Um, we can choose what colour that might be um, depending on, on personal preference. Again, it's just about visual feedback and looking across the desk and seeing what you need. Um, delays in whole milliseconds. Most people in the theatre have this switched on. If I just turn it off for a moment and open up my matrix panel uh, and switch to my delays, you will see that the delay range is up to 1.3 seconds and that's our normal SD um, channel matrix output delay function. If I uh, just put that back down again and close this panel, if I come into my options and switch this to um, whole milliseconds, what it means is I have on my, my pot, my adjustment here, my touch and tone control, I have millisecond accuracy from 0 to 255 milliseconds. Still plenty of range for positioning with a theatre environment. Um, gives us you know, plenty of uh, adjustment, but it does give us a more accurate um, a more accurate adjustment really without having to type values. You can always you know, come in here and type millisecond values in, um, but in terms of assigning the touch and turn control and making adjustments and then being millisecond accurate, uh, sound designers requested that we make this change um, and you know as is the digico way we listen to your requests and thought it was a good idea and that's what we did so you can choose if you want to run the traditional 0 to 1.3 seconds uh, delay or limit it to 255 milliseconds and have um, have millisecond accurate uh, control on the touch and turn um, the last button here delete all unused snapshot data this is sort of a at the end of the programming uh, tech rehearsal point of view, um, you might have made lots of changes and changed your mind about programming. By default, the console stores everything. So you can always go back and find data that you're no longer using. Um, but from a session size point of view, having got to that point and you've got a working show, some people like just to, to purge the session of all that unused data, all the stuff that is no longer used anywhere in the show. Um, again, from a, a efficiency and streamlining point of view, we have a button that allows us to do that. So that's the theatre options panel. Um, worth coming in and having a, a little look at that. So let's have a look at the queue list. Um, there are some things uh, in here which, from our point of view, from the manufacturer's point of view, you should do. Um, and there's some things really you shouldn't do. Uh, let's start by putting auto update on. So down here, bottom right hand corner, auto update switched on. And unless you have a very, very good reason, um, don't switch it off. The idea is this stays on forever and the changes you make and the way you operate the show relies um, on, on this being set. So that goes on. Uh, and similarly, um, as a starting point, the best way to learn this software and understand what we're doing with it is to make sure in your scopes that you have it set something like this. So everything in scope in terms of recall and writing, um, except your control group failures and mutes. So from a creative point of view, from an operator's mixing point of view, you're gonna follow the script, you're gonna follow the lines and the action on stage, you're gonna push your control group faders, um, they're not pre-programmed, that's your manual part of the show. Everything else might well be programmed, but pushing of those control group faders and the mutes is probably gonna be manual. Of course, as with all these things, you know, if you have a specific workflow, a specific way that you wanna work, you can come and change it. But in terms of learning the way that, you know, we intended at least to start with, um, I would say that this is really where you wanna start and then you'll understand what, what we're trying to achieve. So having you know got these things set, 
um, we can go ahead and start making some cues and I can start you know, demonstrating how some of this works. I will say now that these update buttons, update current, update selected, you know, they're mirrored on the work surface as queue update buttons. For 99.9% .9 of the time, you shouldn't be pressing it. There's no need to press it. Auto update does exactly that. It automatically writes all the changes you make to the entire show. Um, you know, there are sets of rules and there are parameters and things to control how it does it, but the idea is you never have to actually do it yourself. Um, so let's create uh, some some queues. I'm just going to create 10 queues. Don't just give them names at this point. Uh, and I'm going to go back up to the top. And actually, what I'm going to do is if I come to my channel section and if I do something simple like put the EQ on and dial some bits in here for you and maybe put the filters on for this channel if I now fire down my cue list so fire next fire next fire next fire next you can see that this EQ hasn't actually changed and it doesn't matter what cue I'm in when I make some changes to this and move it around and you know change uh, whatever I need to change. When I fire up and down the queue list, those changes are automatically written. Um, and this is the point I'm demonstrating, you know, that if you've got a character on stage and they've come on stage, you need to make a change, you know, whether it's in, in rehearsals or actually a running show, when you make the change, you want that change to stick because every time Bob appears on stage, he needs that EQ. We did set one of our options, if you recall, if we go back to the master screen a minute, um, that delay would only be for single queues. And again, remember, I haven't pressed any of my update buttons yet. So if we come back to our channels and we're in queue six at the moment. So if I put my delay on and turn it up, um, if I now fire the next queue, queue seven, you can see that the delay is off. If I go back and fire Q6, you can see that the delay is in. So it's automatically been written for the queue that I am in. Um, so that's showing that difference of how some parameters will update across the entire show, um, the entire queue list, and others will update just to the individual individual queue that I'm in. You know. Bear in mind again, please, I haven't pressed any of these update buttons. It all happens automatically. So, you know, as you're running your rehearsals and and uh, making changes to two channels and, you know, dialing in things that you need to, things that you need to do, uh, those changes will happen for all the channels. Um, of course, you know, variations do happen and sometimes, uh, you need a specific change for a specific reason. Um, this might be, you know, a character change. Um, if we take me Dan channel and I put a hat on, the hat might mean I need a change of EQ. Um, and every time I appear in my hat, again, that would need that different EQ. So we have this system of aliases, an alias being a variation of, of channel settings, really. So in my, uh, my input channel setup here, we have this aliases button. And here we can see this is me, is my standard character um, for the show. And if I create uh, a new alias, and this would be uh, Dan in a, in a hat, I can now choose on this right hand column what the difference is in channel settings between me and me in a hat. You know, my input route might well be the same because my, you know, my radio pack hasn't changed. Um, delays don't need to be different. You know, which aux sends, which foldback mixes, or which you know subgroups I'm going to won't have changed. But the things that make uh, settings personal to a character or a person, the EQ, the filters, dynamics might well be different. So let's leave those um, crossed out and let's write that as a, an alias. So, in Q6, we can now see that I am Dan in a hat, and I'm gonna make the change and give myself a big dip here just so it's very obvious. 
So there's Dan in a hat. If I go back and fire another cue, you can see this goes back to Dan. And I can make a change to Dan, and Dan will be Dan settings for when he doesn't have a hat on. Um, and when I go back to Dan in his hat, we've got Dan in his hat settings. Now I might appear in a hat in the, in the, at the end of the show as well. So if I go down to Q10, come into here and recall Dan in a hat, you can see it pulls in my hat EQ. So we have this concept of you know separating the channel out into different uses, different parts of the channel can be used for different characters. And you could separate the entire channel. Um, so if I come to uh, maybe this channel here, um, if I were to create an alias, uh, a new alias, and make everything different about it, essentially we're reusing the channel for an entirely different character. You know, you may have someone who at the end of uh, Act 1 doesn't return. So instead of having to use a, a different DSP channel on the surface and rearrange your surface and whatever, you could take a channel in a bank um, and separate its use. And for Act 2, use it for an entirely different um, person um, and uh, and have sort of no separation between them, you know, no overlap between them at all. They're entirely separated. So there's lots of flexibility about how we use this this alias's um, this alias's structure can, to control our channel settings. Now these are all based on the fact that probably um, you know you're going to make these sort of changes, uh, you know, use these changes again and again. You know, with a with a character change, you know, every time he appears in a hat, which might be several times, you want all the settings to come back in the right places. There will be times when you just want a one-off change that is literally only ever going to happen once. Um, and uh, not to be repeated ever again. So um, instead of going through the process of creating an alias for this and you know all, all of that, we can use the option all button. If you remember when we were in here, we talked about this Q auto update option all button uh, function, and this is where this is gonna come in. So if, I, uh, if we go back to our channels, um, and let's go to Q5 and just to make it simple we'll stick in this um, this Vicky channel so Q5 channel 5 um, and I'm gonna press the optional button and we've got a nice warning on screen that tells us it's on just a reminder because it you know can have quite a, a big impact um, so if I were to turn on and turn up alt one while the optional button is on and then turn the optional off just to be safe i've just written this change for this one queue only so if i fire up and down the queue list you can see only in q5 here is where the aux one uh, is turned up and on if I go to the other cues and make a change, and we'll just put it on and all the way up, you can see that change is automatically written again for all the cues. But when we get to Q5, Q5 has had like a little flag put on it for AUX1 going, this shouldn't be part of the rule. This is a difference, an exception to the rule. Um, and, uh, and that stays where it is for that one cue. We can still make adjustments to this if I turn it down and off. And fire up and down the queue list you can see all of the others still track and and do the things you'd expect them to do as part of auto update but q5 has been excluded so this is the the option all you know nasty green warning on on screen to make it really clear that you're making a destructive change to the auto update system that's going to be for a one-off event um, but allows us to exclude and, and, and program individual things. There are ways of clearing this out and, and looking at the data and, and fixing mistakes you might have made accidentally. You know, These things do happen. We have mechanisms we'll look at later on in another video to show you how that works. Um, but uh, that's the, the principle behind it. So you know, using a combination of the, the scopes and having auto-update on an aliases 
you know, it does allow us a huge amount of um, programming detail without overcomplicating it. There's, you know, the never the 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 problem of of having to remember to come in here and update your snapshot and you know, did I remember to store the change? Yes or no? All those sort of things disappear. Um, you know, nobody ever waits for sound when it comes to theatre. You just have to sort of crack on and get on with it. They're happy to wait while they reset lights or move scenery around, but the sound department are expected just to to be ready all the time. And these, you know, these functions and these tools that you know I'm showing you here today, um, really are designed to give you speed of operation and, and accuracy and so much control over managing the data. Um, if you do want to sort of vary the way things are auto update and take individual channels out of auto update you can obviously from a global point of view it is global it's only you know whole channel types um, but don't forget down the left hand side here there are both recall scopes so each individual queue and each individual channel for each queue has its own scope so you could be very specific about you know what elements of the console uh, which channels get recalled which ones don't get recalled um, and similarly uh, where you're writing data you know do you want to automatically write data to every channel in every queue or do you want to you know come in here and make some changes the warning of course is you know if you're going to start doing this um, you have to remember what you've done and it gets you know a bit more complicated which is why we try and stick with this you know everything rule and you know globally we try and deal with things in big chunks because it, it just makes things a little bit easier. Um, just down the left hand side while we're looking at it in the queue list, um, crossfades, the ability to crossfade between um, elements of the channel. Um, it really depends on how intricate and how you know detailed you want to go, but the option exists. Um, recall time, so follow on queues, how long queues last for before they automatically uh, carry on. The MIDI programming, um, the skip previous next, you know, if you don't want a, a queue to be fired by the previous next button. Um, and the control by MIDI, actually, from a theatre point of view, uh, and, you know, integration with things like QLab, um, the association between QLab queues and your SD console queues, um, and the, the MIDI relationship about which fires which and the keeping them in order, um, this is the panel where you can define those those queue relationships. Um, some people will run where they fire QLab and QLab triggers the console, and you know, some people do the other way around. Um, but again, there's plenty plenty of control there. Uh, there are some other sort of little bits within the queue list view options. Um, how big a, you know how big you want the queue list and the colours and all of those sort of things. Um, You've got your fire buttons, your rename, and all of the sort of the bits. You know what, what we find a lot of people do is once they get to the system that, that gets the part of programming where they've made Q1, they will sit and make as many. You know, been through the script and make all the queues. You have this, you know, 100, 200 queue list ready to go. So of course you're going to end up adding queues and doing bits of work to it. But for the majority, you know, you want to put the work into getting your structure as right as you can early on in the process so that you know you put auto update on it doesn't matter really what you're doing you can fire around um, and work at speed knowing that the settings um, that you change and all the you know the channel settings and, and adjustments you make are going to be written across all your queues correctly so I think that's sort of uh, not a bad place to stop for today for the introduction to sort of some of the theatre concepts. Um, I'm going to make some more videos on um, on theatre, looking at more in depth. You're know, going to look at the VCA programming, the control group programming, and how we manipulate the data, um, the underlying data for a lot of this. Because actually, you know, this is a very data-driven environment. Um, and how we manage it is, is an important part as operators and sound designers of, of how we understand it. So, you know, having done this first bit, get yourself a copy of the offline software and, um, and have a play and, you know, feel free to reach out to us if, uh, if, if you need some help.